Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Ricky Carruth Show. Today, I've got a really incredible guest. He is a multi-million dollar producer out in Beverly Hills with Compass. This is Mark Hernandez. Mark, what is going on, bro? Hey, Ricky. How you doing? Good, man. Good, you looking good sharp to, there. <laughs> good, to, good to see you. Again. Good to see you again. Thank you very much. Yeah, no, no doubt, man. So, um, yeah, man. So you're you're out in uh Beverly Hills, right? Which is kind of like the the mecca of you know fashion and like where everybody, you know, kind of thinks of high luxury, uh, you know, real estate and stuff like that. So you've been doing this for six years now. You've catapulted to you know the top one, two percent of uh agents in the country. You know, how have you done this? How did you get into real estate? And uh what's going on over there in Beverly Hills? So I got into real estate six years ago. I was uh, previously with Fox Television Networks and American Idol running a national digital ad sales team. Before that, I started in the mailroom at United Talent Agency, also in Beverly Hills, representing and eventually represented screenwriters and directors for motion pictures and television. So I was able to, let me back up. Before that, I started off right out of college in commercial real estate as a commercial real estate agent. I left a career in that, making about a hundred and just call it six figures uh, in uh, retail real estate management, managing you know high end shopping centers. And I left that to start in the mailroom at United Talent Agency, making three fifty a week. So my parents thought I was nuts. Uh, I believed in myself. And looking back, it's the best thing I've, I've ever done. Because if, if you look at what I'm doing today, now many of my clients are, you know, writers, actors, producers, directors, showrunners, people that are in the ad sales and ad tech, uh, you know, industries. And so it was, in hindsight, it may, it may have been a little scary back then, but I'm glad I did it. And it was the best thing I ever did, ever did career-wise. So being in television before you, you know, you got in commercial and you did television for a while, how did the, like, why did you leave? Like did television did the skills that you develop in television help you in the real estate uh, world? And what, and, and yeah. if it did, is that because you had contacts or is it because it helped you with your communication skills or kind of what was the um, correlation? Well, when I was in television, I was always out with, with the team presenting and pitching advertising um, opportunities and sponsorships to Fortune 1000 brands. So it really helped hone the communication skills. Also, you know, developing when you're with Fox television networks and they're, we're constantly creating sponsorships and integrations for the brands online, uh, you know, you, you learn how to produce content. And I think produce learning how to do that has helped me you know, brand my, you know, myself and produce content, whether it's through print advertising, digital advertising, social media, and the like. Um, and then going back to the entertainment business, I think what I learned there the most is I learned how motion pictures and television shows were produced and funded and packaged. <clears throat> and as a result, uh, uh, well, going back, I was I was in a position where there was a line out the door for my job at what I, I did. So either you have to produce or or basically you get canned. Um, so I, I learned to to really jump over obstacles for the client. If if a client wants you to get them into a certain hotel in London or they 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 need something delivered to them, you know, that night, you have to get it done. And if you don't have a way to get it done, then you've got to pull in favors or, or or pay people or do whatever you need to do to get the job done. And I think I, that has carried with me to this day. When I'm representing a listing, listing or a buyer, um, whatever my clients want, I make sure I get it for them. And if I, if I, I don't have an immediate answer at how to get it done, I find that answer very quickly. Who are some of the biggest celebrity names that you worked with? So back when I was at United Talent Agency, uh, you know, we worked with, you know, people, I, I didn't work with them directly, but, you know, I was on, uh, I was working in an office where my boss represented people like Wes Anderson and Owen Wilson and John Favreau and Curtis Hansen, Steve Gagan. We, we, we packaged the script that won the Oscar for the movie Traffic. Um, and, um, you know, those are just a few of the names. That's cool, man. Yeah. So what was your production last year? 
Last year was uh, just about 60, a little over 60 million. How many transactions was that? 45 transactions. Oh, wow. So you weren't selling $5 million homes. This was an average of a million and a half. That's my house. sweet. Yeah. My sweet spot is between one and a half and two and a half. And, and then, you know, those are singles, so to speak. And then, you know, I hit an occasional triple and, and Homer with, you know, 5 million, 10 million here and there. Yeah. What, what can you get in, in Beverly Hills for a million dollars? Uh, maybe a one bedroom condo. Mm -hmm. And so, and you'll sell some of those, like just a one bedroom condo. Yeah, yeah. You know what? I, and I don't just focus on Beverly Hills. I mean, my office where I'm sitting now is in Beverly Hills. I live in the Hollywood Hills and basically I, I cover the greater LA area from, you know, Silver Lake to Santa Monica and uh, you know, wherever my clients need me, that that's where I go. Nice, man. Are you guys seeing, what is the market like right this second? Are you seeing multiple offers, a lot of demand, or are you seeing low demand, inventory rising? What's the climate there right this second? I think the climate is 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 pretty close to what we're seeing everywhere else. But the way I, I tell my clients and, and people that I talk to in the industry, it's it's somewhat, you know, bipolar. You know, there's two opposite ends of the spectrum, you know, on one side, if a house is priced uh, fairly, it's in great shape, it's, you know, staged, it's, it's move in ready, you know, we're seeing multiple offers and we're seeing over list price uh, for that, for that property. Um, if they're not, um, you know, if they're too aspirationally priced, in other words, the, the seller is thinking that their house is worth a lot more than it actually is, if it needs staging and zhuzhing and, and, and uh, you know, a little TLC, they're just, they're sitting and then we're seeing price mm -hmm. reductions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you are seeing some price reductions. You're seeing prices come down. Even the ones that are selling quickly, are they still a little lower price than what they were six to eight months ago? Not really. We're not, not really. really seeing that. No. Yeah. I've got a lot of agents in LA. Um, yeah. And, you know, they, they tell me they're getting multiple offers higher than list price, you know, uh, on a lot of stuff. So really that's what I'm hearing from agents all over the country. It's yeah, like we're, little... Ricky, well, we, yeah, we're, we're seeing multiple offers, but I, I do have to correct. We're not seeing as many. So yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Like, so this um, time last year uh, on a property, we, we could see 20 offers mm -hmm. this year. Maybe we're, we see nine last year. Maybe we're seeing 250 to 300,000 over list now maybe we're seeing 100 to 200 but then pre-pandemic how many how many multiple offers were you seeing oh pre-pandemic we were you know you can see 30 30 offers on a property easily oh really yeah so we so you guys were in this multiple offer market before the pandemic i've been an agent for six years and before compass let's see I want to say that ever since I've been in the business, we've seen, I've seen multiple offers. Yeah. Here in my, in my market down in Gulf Shores, Alabama, we, um, we kind of, we, we, we had, we didn't, we didn't see multiple offers till, um, like any at all until after the pandemic, after the economy opened back up and then about fall, it started to get crazy. Uh, we had a hurricane hit at that time too, which kind of like added to the whole thing, but um, you know, back, you know, let's see when, what, oh, well, I want to say back in 2000, like 18 or so, I started to hear people in Denver were telling me they were getting multiple offers. People in, you know, different places were like, we're getting multiple offers and stuff. And I'm like, oh yeah, because I was around back in 2000, you know, the 2003 and four when wow. that multiple offer, uh, run happened. And, um, I remember what that felt like, you know, like list a property, you know, sells in an hour, multiple offers. And, um, and, but we didn't see that at all. So when the market crashed in 2005 is when it, when it went away and, um, and then, you know, recovered in 2012 and slowly started coming up, we never saw any multiple offer type markets. Right. Really, and um, and I was just thinking, man, you know, that was just such a dream back then, you know, to see this multiple offer thing. And then people started telling me, I'm getting multiple offers, like in 2018 and stuff. And 
I was thinking, wow, you know, that's great. You know, we weren't seeing it at all here, you know, and then after the pan, when the pandemic hit, you know, and the market really went on that run, we were seeing multiple offers on everything. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is insane. You know, but that's interesting though, that you guys have been getting multiple offers, you know, from, from day one. So it's just crazy to even think about that. Because back then in your, in your um, market, you know, pre-pandemic and stuff, I mean, right now, I would imagine you're probably in line with the rest of the country in terms of probably half the inventories you had pre-pandemic. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so, and so even pre-pandemic, when you had twice as many, much inventory as you have now, you guys were still seeing 20, 30 offers on listings and stuff, which really kind of blows my mind thinking about it. Pretty powerful. Yeah. Pretty powerful. Yeah. That's the, that's the one thing that you hear buyers you know complaining about not enough inventory you hear agents complaining about not enough inventory and you know uh, and when it comes up and it's good inventory it goes really quickly it's it's interesting to think about what's going to happen with inventory you know um because obviously there's not enough of it <laughs> and there's obviously there's just not enough and it's like what's going to happen that's going to change that you know Something I think dramatic. the rates are- well, I think the rates are going to have to have to really normalize uh, for sellers to feel comfortable enough to want to sell their house and feel like they can trade, say they can trade up without, you know, doubling or tripling their interest rate. Yeah, but pre-pandemic, you probably had twice as much inventory as you had now, as you have now and you still were getting 30 offers a, a a property, you know, that probably priced well or whatever, you know, you're still like, you're still too, you're still didn't have enough inventory. Even if you double the inventory today, yeah, chances are you're probably still in a deficit in terms of inventory. Well, I, I think I heard a statistic once. I think it was uh, someone at CAR that I know who said for the past 10 years, this, this is a few years back. So let's just say past like 12 or 13 years now. Um, California should be building about 140,000 units, housing units a year to keep up with the, you know, in migration population growth and whatnot. And we've been averaging only about 100,000. So we're constantly, you know, in, in the red inventory wise, so to speak. Yeah. I've heard like numbers, like, you know, we're, we're like a, a million short a year or something like that. Like, I, yeah. you know, don't quote me on it, but like, I've heard all the, and I've been hearing these numbers for years, right. That we're down, like we're not building enough homes. And of course I'm in Alabama and I'm thinking, whatever, you know, we, we've got plenty of <laughs> stuff. Things aren't yeah. going in a day. We're not getting multiple offers and stuff, but come to find out they were absolutely right. Like we should have been building way more houses because now you look and say, my God, now builders are down 30% on new construction. And you think, where's this inventory going to come from? Like we're, we're in a, what to me, we're just in like this really dark, deep, dark hole of like lack of inventory that I do not know how we're going to dig out of it. Unless, unless we see another wave of foreclosures or like interest rates go to 10%, like, I don't see either one of those situations happening. You know what I mean? So I honestly just don't know. And now you have a lot of builders building multifamily to rent instead of building single family for people to buy. Mm -hmm. Just crazy, man. The whole thing is just nuts. I don't know what to make of it, man. I read stuff every day. I'm on podcasts with people every day and collaborating with all kinds of people in the industry. And I'm just like, I can't make heads or tails of this thing. Honestly, it's fun. (laughs) <laughs> there's just a lot. Yeah, there's a lot. Obviously, there's a lot of noise out there, you know, with with all the press and, you know, what, what's that uh, that little phrase I heard recently that headlines are meant to terrify, not to clarify, because, you know, they get they sell more ads by, you know, getting either the click throughs or the, you know, the. it was the, like today I saw an article, you know, we've uh-huh. been seeing a lot of negative articles. And today I saw an article that said something about the housing surge or something right an article and what they were talking about was eight percent month over month pending home sales growth you know from december to january well that's true because interest rates went down to 5.99 for a second and a lot of people put in applications we had a huge mortgage application rush for a second before rates kind of bounced back up that was just a short-lived head fake and (laughs) here this article is you know 
Like, so they play it both ways. Like if they say something in the, in the data that they can say, Oh, this bad thing's going to happen or in the middle of bad stuff happening, you've got this glimmer of something positive. They're going to twist that too. What we're going to really see, what's really going to be fearful for people is pretty soon if prices even just stay the same. Okay. Mm -hmm. Prices level out right here, which I don't believe is going to happen. I think they're going to continue to soften. But even if they stayed the same, we're going to intersect yes, last year where we go negative year over year pretty soon. Like probably in the next 30 days or so, we're going to hit negative year over year, like national prices. And that's when we're going to see, I think, some super negative headlines. Even if prices are the same now, we're still getting multiple offers. The market is fine. You know, we're, we're going to see some pretty dark and gloomy headlines whenever that happens. And it's going to get worse and worse because even if it stays the same, you know, last year the prices were going up, up to a certain point, you know, it was like June, they peaked out. So really June is probably going to be the worst year over year, like price decline, where you're probably going to see a, a really hefty number, like 17% or something year over year price declines. When in fact, the market in June is probably going to be better than it is right now. Because honestly, I, I'm expecting, and a lot of mortgage people and really bright economic people are expecting to see some really positive year-over-year -year inflation numbers May 10th when that CPI report comes out. And they believe that that's going to be an inflection point for mortgage rates, whereas they start to get a little better you know, than where they are now. So if that happens May 10th, then you got June, then you got July, you know, say prices soften a little as well. Then you got prices softening and mortgage rates softening. You know, June's going to be a hell of a month, you know, and at the same time, we're going to see massively negative headlines. It's going to be, it's going to be fun. I'm excited. Well, we shall see. We shall see. Like, uh, I mean, who, re who, who really knows, right? I mean, exactly. It is, it's constantly changing. It reminds me of the, uh, the, uh, the screenwriter, author William Goldman who wrote a book and and in it he said no one knows anything right and so I mean at the end of the day we just you know we'll we'll see where we where we're heading but uh you know we'll get there when we get there. And we know where we know where we're gonna end up. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean I I'm gonna end up at the top. I'm gonna That's be right. right up there. That's right. Right up there at the top. That's it doesn't matter thing. what happens. I'm you gonna have, have that fun. in common all day long. Absolutely. I mean, I, you've got, I mean, you, I mean you, how long, how many years have you been in this? Twenty one. So yeah, you've seen the highs and the lows, and you've adapted. You know, no matter what the market is, rather than just you know sit back and say, "Whoa, is me." To me, it's fun. Just you know, all this stuff. That's why here in a minute, I'm gonna go live just to talk to the struggling agents, have them come on and tell me their situations, and try to help them. You know, game plan and stuff, just to get back because. There's a lot of agents that are just, you know, confused. You know, yeah. they got in the market during COVID. I'm going to make a ton of money. You know, the market was overheated and then it goes to from one extreme to the next. You know, <laughs> it's confusing. Well, it's pretty easy. I mean, it's not too difficult to get a license these days, right? And people think that they can just get their license and with, with very, some of them, right? With, with very little like business experience and yeah, there's a lot of people that came out of right? television and stuff. Exactly. They just thought I'm going to come in here and sell some Beverly Hill houses and, you know, just crush it. Right. <laughs> uh, thanks Ricky. I'm, I am crushing it. <laughs> oh man. I had to mess with you nice, for a second, nice. but yeah, yeah don't, the bear don't, the, don't quit your day job on that one. Uh, <laughs> honestly, bro, honestly, though, the thing about that, and people say that all the time about the barrier of entry, if it wasn't so low, honestly, I wouldn't be here. Like yeah, I picked, true. I picked real estate yeah. over being a doctor or lawyer because yeah. it's one class versus 10 years. And if it was, well, yeah. if it was any more than that, I don't honestly don't know if I would be here. True. Yeah, no, I, I guess my point is, and by the way, I believe real estate is a very noble profession. I, 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 you know, I never realized that until I got into it. I guess what I was referring to more about the low barrier event entry is more that pe some people think it's going to be easy and it's not, yeah. it's a noble profession, but it's not an easy profession, right? Yeah. It takes a lot of work, a lot of strategy, 
a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, you know, 24-7, 365. And, uh, and if, if you think that you can get your license and just come in and it's going to be easy, that you're in for an awakening. That's true. Because it's a low barrier of entry, it kind of gives the illusion that since it's so easy to get your license, it's going to be easy to make money. Exactly. Yeah. I never thought about it like that. That's inter That's an interesting take. Cool. So what's the goal for this year? Where Where is Mark going from here? So I'm, I'm continuing to build my team. I've got a team of uh, five agents here at Compass Beverly Hills, did 60 million in 20. 22 and uh the goal for this year is 100 million and uh you know we're just chugging along doing everything we need to be doing to to achieve that and uh you know we're very optimistic what's your strategy as far as lead gen um you know stuff like that building business getting leads so we you know i got my start when i got my start uh back six years ago i I really built my business on buyers and on open houses. And, you know, the thought being that, you know, people that come to open houses, if you can convert them into your clients, you know, they're the most ready to go. And, and so we're continuing to do that on the team. And I'm continuing to work with and, and mentor the agents on the team to hustle up as many open houses, whether there are our listings or other agents listings and, uh, and, and get it that way. I have a, a, I have a, a fairly large sphere of influence. So I'm constantly making phone calls to all of the people that I've met, you know, both recently and over the years through the various industries that I have, and also working the uh, agent to agent uh, referral network. Yeah, calls as well, that's big. I mean, we've got 30,000 agents. Uh, countrywide, uh, nationwide with Compass. And, you know, I, I show up to a lot of the events, a lot of the retreats. I, you know, I, I do online Zoom calls with agents in other uh, states and other cities. And as a result, it's been very fruitful. So those are the, you know, those are the main, and then of course, marketing. I mean, marketing, biz, all business, Peter Drucker said, business is marketing and innovation, right? And so if you're not marketing, whether it's print or digital or outdoor or social media, which is marketing, uh, you know, you really don't have a business. So we're, we're really leaning forward into our, our marketing, our video marketing, our print marketing. I, when I'm done with this call, I've got to go over some uh, full page ads that I'm, I'll be doing an ad. I should say some versions of an ad for the Hollywood Reporter, the Oscar edition. Um, and, uh, you know, that's what we're doing. So when you build your database, do you put it in one air, one spot, like one CRM? Uh, okay. And then from there, what's your bread and butter? What's the foundation of your remarketing to your database so that no one in that database ever forgets who you are, what you do, and that you're here to help? So we have a very robust CRM. It's an internal a proprietary CRM here at Compass. It's, you know, it's part of the end-to-end -end system that Compass has built, spent over a, a billion dollars mm -hmm. to create this. We've just recently added te uh, title and escrow into it to where you could push a button in the CRM, order a preliminary title report or open an escrow. But back to your question, um, you know, once a contact goes into the CRM, I've got a number of different action plans, depending on whether it's, a, you know, agent to agent touches, if they're past client touches, if their open house touches to where, you know, they get, you know, both phone calls, emails, all automated over certain frequencies of time. Are those frequencies uh, like for, do you have anything that's in place that's just going to go on forever? They pretty much, I mean, in, until you tell, until you tell it to stop it, it kind of goes into a repeat mode. I'm pretty sure I haven't got to the gotcha. end yet. Gotcha. 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 Now I was just, I was just wanting to understand. Good question, your though. I just want to understand your back end a little more. You know, I simplified the whole thing myself in my business to just everybody goes into constant contacts. And then I develop a weekly email on the same day of the week forever, send it out. Everybody remembers who I am. I don't have to really remember anything else. Right. So they call me when That's they're awesome. ready to buy or sell. Yeah. For me, simplicity is is so key. Otherwise, I'm just uh, just get in the weeds so quickly, you know. Well, so. I, yeah, I've seen that often with with I mean, personally at, at times and with other agents. You know, if it's just not simple, people won't use the system, right? Yeah. 
And that's one of the reasons why I just really love the compass system is rather than having, you know, different bolt-ons of here's your CRM and here's your marketing tool and whatnot. It's just all in one place. And I mean, there's a lot to learn, but once you learn it, it, it really is super powerful. No, that's cool. And then you said that coming from TV, you were kind of a natural at that point coming into real estate as a content creator, right? Yeah. So just touch on that for just a second, as far as, you know, content, like, are you know, are you making like X amount of videos a week? Uh, you, you know, what platforms, like, what do you, what do you do in there? And what's some good advice for somebody trying to yeah. get into the video game? I'm working on upping my video game for sure. I think, you know, lean forward video is, is the name of the game in, in marketing currently. And it has been for, for some time, but I think some of the takeaways that I've learned from marketing, you know, for the network was, you know, you have to be, you really have to differentiate your creative. There's got to be strong calls to action. The messaging, the copy has to, has to have some kind of a hook or speak to the, the person that's in, engaging with it. So, you know, I create, I, I have a, a, a lifestyle email that goes out once a week. It goes out every Saturday at 8 a.m. Uh, and, you know, so many agents and managers have been telling me that they love my email because it's it's really not about real estate. You know, so many agents have, you know, your marketing report and what's listed, what's sold. And I'm taking a little different tack on it. And, and basically my email is like a magazine, right? So there, you know, just like you open a magazine, there might be an architectural section. There might be a, you know, a health and beauty section. There might be, you know, a music section uh, or film or whatnot. That's what I'm doing with my marketing emails. And uh, it's gone from, I think we're in issue, we just hit issue 45. That's 45 weeks of it. And we, we started with, you know, almost nothing. And I think we're almost up to 5,000 recipients now. And that's everybody uh, in your database, right? I know I probably have about 11,000 in my database. So why don't you send that out to everyone? Well, it's, you know, I've got some cleaning up to do some scrubbing to do. So we're, 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 we're adding to that. Yes. But very selectively, mm -hmm. right. Rather gotcha. than just, just, just hit them up, hit up everybody and then just get all the unsubscribes. Um, so just a little bit more targeted there. And then, you know, when it comes to whether it's a print ad or a postcard or something, you know, where if I'm going to retreat at Compass and I want to meet more agents, you know, I'll design a, I wonder if I have one here, like a postcard. Um, no, I don't have one here. So, you know, the, the, you know, where I'll use like Roy Lichtenstein type, you know, pop art to design a comic book looking strip that talks, you know, with a woman talking to a, a, a man about who's who should I contact with for real estate in Los Angeles, call Mark Hernandez. So things that are different, things that stand out, things that tap into pop culture. And, uh, you know, I did a piece, I've, I've done a piece, uh, it's a Monopoly piece. So I basically designed a Monopoly card rather than say Marvin Gardens or Boardwalk, it says Wilshire Boulevard, which is the street out, out front here in Beverly Hills. And basically it says, do not pass, you know, do not pass go, uh, you know, when you're in Los Angeles without basically contacting me. And then I invite him to come by the office. I'll give you an office tour. I'll take you to broker open houses. We'll see some really, you know, hot cribs out there. And then basically, uh, you know, end up having coffee, lunch, drinks, whatever. And people love that card. I've used it in social media. I've sent it out in my email blast and I've literally gone to retreats and passed them out. And that, that piece has gotten, gotten a lot of traction, but again, it's like, it's just being creative and I like to be creative. Yeah, man. That's good, man. Well, listen, <laughs> this was incredible, bro. It was good to spend some time with you, get to know your business a little better. I'm sure a lot of people are going to get a lot of value out of this. Where can people find you, follow you, uh, all that good stuff. So, yeah. So I'm uh, on Instagram. I'm the Mark Hernandez. There's been a few spoofs, so don't fall for any extra Z's or underscores. Um, and you can find me on LinkedIn as well, Mark Hernandez. Um, and then my email address is mark with a C dot Hernandez at compass.com. Cool, cool, man. That's awesome. Yeah, you guys, uh, if you have any 
referrals out that way. Be sure to hit Mark up. He'll take really good care of your clients. And again, man, I really appreciate you coming on and spending some time with us today and sharing some of your, you know, wisdom from over there in Beverly Hills. Ricky, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. I followed you for quite some time. And, you know, back in the day, you used to make the uh, 150 phone calls in like two hours on the Mojo Dialer. So got yeah. that from you. But anyway, thanks again. Yeah, man. Enjoy. Have a good rest of your day. All right. Be well.